Okay. Um, let's do the terrible erosion question. Hopefully you don't see a question like this on your exam because like I discussed yesterday, the last video, um, it's the worst. Good morning, Sophia. Good morning. You can go outside, sweet girl. You can go outside. Okay. So, ugh. I talked out like how we're going to answer this in the end of the last, uh, the last video I did, but it, it is awful. Okay. So we're going to need to include, we need to reference the four main types of erosion. Um, and this was like a vocab assignment for I think chapter 2.2 maybe. Um, and how erosion can affect the, um, creation or morphology of the different types of shores. And these were the shores that they had in their answer key. Um, but I don't know why they didn't do Delta. It's annoying. Um, anyway, I don't make the test. Okay. Um, your four types of erosion. Um, something else I would put to, who knows if they would take it or not. I've actually already seen where the uh, mark scheme is actually different in different places. And I'll talk about that when I do paper too. But um, I would give a definition because it is an explained command word. So erosion. Is the movement of sediment. Or like weathering is the breaking down of sediment. Um, don't write MVMNT. Don't write that on your test. Okay, there's glacier or glacial or ice. Um, you also have water. Wind erosion. gravity just by listing them isn't really going to be enough you will have to reference it and um yeah reference it like say like a statement about them essentially all right so these will move um i'll put large amounts of sediment and or rock. It can like carve through it. Water, um, this one will like, you can also refer to it as like runoff. Carry sediment. Um, Wind blows blows particles to other areas. What should I say here to other like what? Water bodies. So it's like your delta. Um, gravity. Um, I hope you don't get a question like this, but if that's the case, um, 2W, 2G, I don't know, 2G, 2W, I don't know, something like that, erosion, wind, water, gravity, and glacier, or maybe like make a, some weird word with the two W's and I and a G, I don't know, but that's going to be something I would do. Um, if literally, if I cared enough, because I'm, you know, obviously I think you can tell that I think this is a, a terrible question. Just, just an educator point of view. Okay. And then your shoreline. So 
how erosion affects it. So how erosion affects, we could do the rocky shore. Again, erosion is the movement of water. Don't do the arrows on your test either, because then you are going to assume that they understand it and don't ever assume that somebody in, even though they also speak English, like don't assume that they have the same type of um, like note taking mindset that I do. Um, there's high levels of erosion. Um, remember Rocky Shore, it, because of like the waves, um, they experience the highest amounts of erosion, but they are the most resistant because they're made of rocks. Um, so there's one and then within that we could say um uh remember rocky shores have larger particle sizes where like the muddy shore has the smallest their shorelines made of silt um and it also says larger rocks can fall to like the lower shore area like the gravity one i guess larger LGR. All right, and then maybe like this area here <clears throat> allows for like some tide pooling, maybe like within these crevices, whenever the tide goes down. There's your rocky shore, sandy shore. Here's contradiction. Literally the notes that we made for sandy shore. Um, are they on here? Yep. They're, um, they don't hold water well, right? Because they're very porous. They're incredibly unstable. Why? Because of erosion. Because of erosion. Shifting substrate. On their mark scheme, though, go back to the test. On the mark scheme, you bet it doesn't say that. Low levels of erosion. Yeah, right. We live here. We like, literally live here. I would say... Um, like it's that's why it has small niches. That's why it's unstable because it's easily erodible. I would say it's dependent on waves. Waves, and I wouldn't put and right. Maybe do one of these tide changes. Um, and actually, that slash would kind of mean the same thing. So maybe just choose one, just in case you don't contradict yourself. Um, waves or tide changes can easily erode um, porous substrate. There you go. So yeah, right. Try and take a mark from that. You can't. Um, you have it small or fine particles deposited on shore. And that would be like with like that longshore drift, like the moving um, in and out of the water uh, or of the water, um, like with waves and tides. And then you have like, of course, like the, the prevailing winds um, blowing water up the coast, like long along the shore, um, which is why like when you go in the ocean, then you usually don't end up in that same place because the wind is blowing you. It also will blow particles that way. Ooh, gentle slope. You know the slope for the rocky shore. Let me put that on there. For that, gravity can cause um, larger rocks to fall on the lower shore area. Um,
can be flat or vertical cliffs. I'll highlight these for you so you can see the different ones. Rocky Shore, Sandy Shore. Great. And then the other one that they, um, uh, sorry, that's one here. R8, right? Don't write that. All right. I think the rate of erosion and deposition are kind of the same, but that's not like they're pretty much equal. Like it's easily erodible, but then it's also deposited. But that is not what the mark scheme says. <laughs> rate of erosion um, is less than rate of deposition. I don't agree with that, but whatever. I don't have the data to back it up, just the visual experience. Your other one is um, um estuary or a muddy shore. M estuary would be like the Indian River Lagoon. Um, or yeah, a muddy shore. Um, again, so we we know the muddy shore pretty well, right? In order to make mud, you can't have waves. So we're gonna have very low erosion levels. And I think for the ease of considering erosion, um, it doesn't matter like your shore type if you have wind like wind will erode particles it won't erode like your large particle sizes um but wind is not dependent on your shoreline um particle sizes matter so like waves is the biggest thing that's going to affect that um same with glacier like glacial erosion that's going to only occur where like where you have glaciers carving into the like the substrate not happening everywhere waves happen pretty much everywhere or like within every ocean. So um, that's something that I consider like, waves um, erode. If you have waves, you're gonna have erosion. In a muddy shore, like a swamp or like a salt marsh or a mud flat, you're not gonna have waves. You don't have waves there. If you had waves there, then the sediment wouldn't be able to settle and you would not be able to make mud. So like mud literally is the result of the finest, tiniest particles being able to settle. Like it's made of silt. Those are the smallest particles. Um, and if you don't have erosion, then you're able to have sedimentation or deposition, the depositing of sediment or sedimentation is like the buildup of sediment. So I, I would like go with that. Waves and erosion. Muddy shore estuary. Um low erosion levels. Um silt particles or the small sediments. Um and these are flat. All right, there's that terrible question. Bye. Okay, so um, remember these essentially are gonna be um, how we answer, and I made this note page if anybody's watching this that's not um, my student, it's just one of the notes I gave them. We're gonna mention stability, oxygen absorption, respiration of course, um, salt tolerant, viviparous reproduction, propagule, um, do, 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 floats in the water, they need to, yeah, they stand up, like, they need to, like, attach, um, upright into the substrate, um, so they can start growing right away, they have salt exclusion, um, remember what we called their leaves, I said tough or leathery. I would just choose one. I said thick, but whatever. Okay. And then, yeah, the substrate is something else we need to mention. Lack of oxygen in substrate, we call that um, not anaerobic, but anoxic. Okay, so I'm going to answer C then right now. And then I'll do the sandy shore. <laughs>
Okay. Let's talk about the prop roots first. And this was um, explain how red mangrove is adapted to this environment. And they were talking about like littoral is an intertidal zone um, of tropical and subtropical areas. We have a lot of mangroves here. Um, so the biggest thing is like you could have really <clears throat> high salinity, very low salinity. If there's a lot of runoff or precipitation. If the water is really warm. You're going to have a lot of evaporation. So an excess amount of salts will stay there. Um, also in warmer like or in smaller bodies of water, they get really warm. And so you're not going to be able to hold oxygen well in smaller bodies of water. And that's a problem. Um, also, the substrate is soft because they have roots. So it's not going to be like um, something that you need to hold fast to attach to. It's not rock. It's, it's soft. So they do need roots. So they have prop roots. They provide stability um, in an unstable substrate. The only thing we really refer to as an unstable substrate were sandy things, sandy shores. Um, unstable, or you could say like a muddy substrate, um, shifting substrate even. Okay. Sorry. All right. Okay. Um, the prop roots also take in oxygen. Again, so referring to the prop roots. And why is that necessary for that ecosystem? Because if it's muddy, mud does not like gases go through. It's so tiny. Um, and it typically smells that way as well. And then, um, again, if like the, it's in standing water twice a day, you know, because of your tide levels, then oxid, like those roots would rot. So those roots are actually able to absorb water that are outside of the organism itself. These right here. I don't know why you wouldn't get another mark for using vocab, so I would throw it in there, the lenticels. <sighs> All right. Where am I at? Okay. Um. The salt exclusion. And this isn't part of the mark, but I would say due to salinity changes two times a day. It's not a part of the mark scheme, but I just like to add a little bit there. Okay, so that's good for the prop roots. Oh, shoot. No, they do have it there. The high salinity of the water. All right, we can talk about the other parts of them. There's your prop roots. I wouldn't write tough and leathery. I really would just pick one. This decreases water loss. Oh, here's a mistake. Their mark scheme says evaporation, but when you lose water through the leaves, it's called transpiration, not evaporation. Transpiration. Um, we're not going to say transpiration or evap. Because we're not going to say evaporation because that's not correct. We know it. Um, that's thanks to Bradley in my fourth period class. Um, water loss, I would just say decreases water loss through leaves. 
or transpiration. I'm going to spell it right. When we lose water, it's perspiration. Um, there's five marks. I'm just going to have about one that's six. It's so dumb. Okay. Other things they have. Viviparous reproduction, which is cool. Like Vivi or like Viva, like life. Um, have viviparous reproduction, which means that the, the offspring starts to grow on the parent, right? They're not like dropping seeds and then hoping that the wind will take it or something. They're like, no, I got you. They're going to allow it to grow on the parent. They fall. They can float in the water for around 40 days. They can even be in the water for up to a year. But then they need to land um, in a, uh, like a soft sediment area that's obviously in the water. Um, but they need to land upright. Propagules. We have prop roots and propagules, little little prop babies. They land or they settle upright versus like just a seed just having to get buried, but they're already starting to grow their leaves. They're I'm sorry, they're already starting to grow their roots. Like this whenever they land. And we have this in my classroom. You can see that their long roots are like this. Okay. Sand to yourself substrate. Um, mangroves are also really good at slowing down wave energy or water currents with with these right? They act with their prop roots. They act like a cage. Um, where did I have that? Calmer waters. Yes. Okay. Um, maybe I didn't write it. I don't know. I, oh yeah. Yes. They grow from the sides of the curve and they, tr um, the trunk and they curve outwards. Keep the tree up and, um, shifting and stable substrate. Keeps it away from being washed away from waves. Um, but yeah, and they do like, they, you know, as water is flowing past them, it does slow them down so like particles can settle. And then this actually will start to build up this um, this area, which is why like in the foreground, you can see you have like a little mangrove forest here. They literally will start to have sediment build up around them. And that again, just like re-anchors them in. Um, this is a great habitat for your um, uh, larvae forms of a lot of fish. They'll come here for a nursery. Um, you have when it's um, in, you know, a bigger estuary area that is not low in oxygen. And it's not like a marsh or a muddy area. Um, there's an ample amount of oxygen from them for respiration that, you know, they produce because they're producers and organic material and then hiding spots and they make the waters calmer. It's lovely. Okay, let's do our sandy shore. And I did um, a screen recording of this early last week. Okay. There's a lot for this one, but that's good. Um, describe the features of a sandy shore and list or outline how Organisms that live here are adapted to cope with the abiotic factors of the environment. So these are non-living. How? Adaptations, how are they helping? Like, what is the sandy shore like? And what are these organisms doing to make sure they can stay alive in it? Nope. 
I'm just comparing it to, okay, what I put on your Google Classroom. They are unstable. Oh. Able or able, whatever. Engineering wind or water erosion. The sediment can move via long, short drift, and I pointed that out for you in a separate YouTube video. Some trade is porous, or it has drying and wet cycles based on your tides. No substrate for attachment. Um, because there's no substrate for attachment, um, there's not going to be biodiversity. Within the substrate, again, the um, particles are small. Okay, so all of this is about the substrate. Okay, but so these are a lot of, these are abiotic factors. Um, some biotic factors that this is going to cause, all of this, right, because of all of this. Mm -hmm. You're going to have low. Um, Productivity, which is the rate of organic material production, which is going to cause low food availability. And I've been just trained so well to not say food. Um, organic material. You never know who's going to be reading your test and have a bias over that. But um, it would be like low food sources. This is going to cause low biodiversity. And I know they said, like, outline the abiotic factors. Obviously, productivity, availability of food, biodiversity, those are all biotic factors. Um, their niches are wide because they don't have to have specific roles at all. Remember, with niches, you say roles. Always, 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 always. Organisms role in this ecosystem. But, yeah, they're not going to be very specific and have to, like, stay in their lane at all. Like, you can choose any lane. Nobody wants to be here. It's, it's very hard to live there. And the only ones that want to live there are able to burrow. But low biodiversity, there's low niches, or low available, or yeah, they're wide. We'll say wide. They're not very narrow. Or like a coral reef has very narrow niches. Everybody knows exactly their role in that situation and they're not gonna overlap niches or there will be competition. And then competitive exclusion principle says that if two organisms are occupying the same niche in the same place at the same time, or two species occupying the same niche, same habitat, same time, one will have to leave or one will have to die. Uh, low biodiversity, wide niches. Um, okay. And so we'll say organisms. So then two, these are all biotic factors. Must burrow. Um, for temperature control. Remember, like in a 
or they can close their shell like in a rocky shore organisms will close their shell or like if they have you know like any sort of shell situation if they can't close it they can just like retract into it like a limpet or a chitin um, or any of like the periwinkle little snails and that is so that they can maintain water for gas exchange and temperature control temperature control um protection from predators those organisms that burrow a lot of them might, might look like this like even like a sand dollar um so they are flat say flattened and that's like dorsally so like via the top or ventrally like on the bottom they're flat um, for easier burrowing also um, they are camouflaged I'm just gonna add to this there's a lot of options here adding to it never gonna spell it right Camouflage like within their substrate. I get like the colors of shells versus like the substrate that they're in. Um, the last two marks, they can come into the water column to feed when the tide is in, and they can move up and down the beach with the tide. So I guess that's also how that they're gonna um, cope with their changing abiotic factors. They can pretty much go wherever they want as long as they're not going to die. Move up and down the beach with tide. It's like as your water comes in, they can move up with it. And then as it starts like retreat back, they can go back with it. Damn, we got two left. Okay. I did this water question in the beginning of the year. Water is an unusual substance. It is the only solid of its molecule, literally, that um, where its solid is less dense than its liquid form. That's because of density. Explain, so why, the importance of this to marine life. So we'll need to consider um, how it's helpful. This was like a 3.2. Um, 3.2 notes. <clears throat> I did on Google Slides. There's not a lecture for it or anything. Um, so we had class time to do it. But 3.2 notes were on Google Slides. I like finished them up over spring break. And uh, what else? Um, yeah. When that sea ice melts, it releases a lot of like the dead things that have died on it. Um, like when it melts, it seasons. All the dead things that have died on it. Um, any like sediment or nutrients or um, inorganic materials that it picked up maybe. And then um, now it gets released into the water and then you have huge plankton blooms. And that's um, able to be seen via like satellite imagery of the like chlorophyll. Okay, so it provides. Habitat for organisms to live on. Okay, and then within that, we could say like large up on the top of it or the surface. Those are called ice algae. 
Go figure. Um, okay, great. Water. Oops, not water, the ice. Shoot. Darn it. Um, the ice can act as a thermal insulator. No, it's not. No, it's the water. Dense, not the ice. I feel dumb. Water. Remember, it's a high heat capacity. Okay. Water is the thermal insulator. And the ice on there is going to be the habitat. Um, this helps. And this, again, is they're talking about the water, not the ice. But helps maintain higher temps, like higher water temps or warmer water temperatures. Um, again, it's about sea temperatures in the winter. Separates the cold atmosphere, ATM. Don't write that on your test. Um, and like the water. I think this one is actually referring to the ice itself, but there's a chance I could be wrong. I don't think so, though. Yeah. All right. Last one. We did this together. Woo! All right. So using examples, you need examples. Talk about medicine. Talk about Alzheimer's. Talk about direct food resources. Um, talk about how maybe they protect shorelines. Um they help absorb CO2. We like annotated these notes together and then I did a separate screen recording for it and put it in your Google Classroom. So using examples, the importance of main F, the importance of maintaining global marine biodiversity in terms of the services it provides. And here are the services. There are one, two, three, four, five of them. Yes, okay. So services, medicines, food sources. That's an easy one. And for medicines, um, if you did 4.2, like all the classification of organisms, you came across that so many times, like shark liver oil, um, uh, cod oil, um, the sea cucumbers. There's, there's too many to name. Um, seaweed extracts. Um, I'll do environmental. protection. So maybe like coral reefs decreasing wave energy, mangroves slowing down water currents. And then one that doesn't really have any examples with it, um, high biodiversity. Biodiversity is the number and amount of different organisms um, in an environment, and it's not just that, it's also, spe um, it's also species diversity, so like the different types of them, um, the genetic diversities, like what are their genes like, or are those species all the same, and then ecosystem um, biodiversity.
stable ecosystems. Oops. Okay, and then your examples, which you need to have or you won't get full marks. This is actually a really short section in the book. So medicines. Um, shark liver oil for arthritis. Um, the keyhole limpet is the one that they talked about that you need to give a named example. I think the keyhole limpet um, helped with like cancers and Alzheimer's. There's no way I spelled that right, although I think I did, which is nuts. Pick one for food sources. Shellfish, um, seaweeds, uh, mollusks. So like snails or bivalves, like a um, scallop or a clam. Environmental protection, so shoreline protection. We need examples though. Climate control, so it's all about photosynthesis. So um, we'll say uh, phytoplankton, do not put phyto on your test, just put phytoplankton, phytoplankton, um, marine plants, Absorb CO2, which is good because that is a greenhouse gas, but that also will create carbonic acid in dissolved shells. Um, and then release O2 in photo. Don't put photo on your test. All right. I guess I'm going to get ready for work and get all of up and move it along. But paper two has effectively been gone through. And... Um, I will also be doing the different parts to paper one. I will absolutely not do all of paper one at once, but not paper one, paper two. I won't do it all at once, but it'll be done. Thanks for watching, you guys. Good luck today. Um, remember some buzzwords. Remember some specific um, definitions. And um, when in doubt, draw it out. Have a good eraser. Have a great.